You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to, um, the Farland Story Show. I'm your host, Mr. Jakes. We've already looked at all seven of the Farland Story games for PC-98. I think it would have been nice and neat if they had just ended Farland Story there and started on the Farland Saga games when they moved over to Windows in 1996. But apparently TGL still had one last Farland Story they had to tell one which ties together the previous two games. So although we've finished the series on PC-98, I feel like it wouldn't be right to wrap things up without looking at the final mainline Farland Story game, Farland Story 8, Kyoshin no Miyako, which I'll translate as City of Mad Gods. It may seem strange to call this one a forgotten game in the series, after all this is the one for Windows, but for some reason in my experience people tend to forget this one exists, maybe because PC-98 fans tend to focus on the 7 PC-98 games, or maybe because this one doesn't seem to be exactly a fan favorite from what I can gather. And by the way, like the previous game, Farland 8 has never received an English fan translation, aside from a partial one that doesn't include the story. So, this is the only copy of the game I have. It was originally released in a plastic clamshell case, similar to the PC-98 games, complete with a poster, large manual, and printed CD-ROM. But instead I have the budget re-release from the TGL 2000 series, which was priced at only 2,000 yen and released in the year 2000. I remember buying this in a brick-and-mortar electronics store in Japan, probably in 2002. To run this game, at the minimum, you're going to need a blazing fast Pentium processor running at 75 megahertz and 16 megabytes of RAM, so I hope you've been saving your allowance money for a fancy new gaming PC. Inside we have a very bare bones disc and a tiny black and white manual which covers not only how to install and play the game, but a bit of information on the characters. I've also got a survey card shoved in here. So to install the game, let's insert the disc in my Windows 10 PC. We simply run the setup.exe contained on the disk, and the installer itself runs with surprisingly no issues at all. However, to help you get the best experience playing the game on a modern PC, here are a few tweaks that you can pause and take a look at if you like. Start the game and the opening sequence begins. It's actually pretty similar to the ones in previous games, showing some of the main characters and hinting at some of the later events of the game. We can also see some familiar faces from Farland 6 and 7. Those games both took place in separate worlds, so it'll be interesting to see how they managed to work them in. Unlike previous games, the story in 8 is divided into four chapters, each consisting of several stages. The first chapter introduces our main protagonist, Ryan, and his best buddy, a magical creature named Kirin. Ryan, it is discovered, is a spell breaker, meaning that he has the innate ability to cancel spells. Thanks to this talent, he is discovered by a great wise man named Safkiel, who takes him under his wing and raises him at the School of Magic Technology in the floating capital city of Elder. Ryan learns from Safkiel that their world is slowly dying, thanks to humans depleting its natural energy known as Ether, which fuels their technology. We are also introduced to Safkiel's two daughters, who are actually man-made humans, named Ariane and Sylvia. Safkiel believes that the ancients had discovered a way to create Aether themselves, so he takes Ryan and Ariane to explore some ancient ruins, where they discover an entrance to the Garden of the Gods. There Safkiel begs an angel to ask the gods to save their world, but she's like, no, the gods have all left and gone away. You got yourselves into this mess. Deal with it. They fight with a demonic looking angel and discover that it was a machine. Safkiel concludes that the gods must all be nothing but machines. He asks the angel that if the gods are machines, then who built the gods? She says his question doesn't make sense. There's only one god and nothing higher. She sends them all away without answering any further questions. After this revelation, Safkiel seems to have suddenly developed a maniacal laugh, and I think you can probably guess who the main villain is going to be by this point. 
Back at the capital, Safkiel has begun building a strange circular airship called Heaven's Ring, and when showing it to the king, he suddenly assassinates him by making him float in the air and then stretch squashing him. Ryan and Kirin have witnessed the entire thing. Oh. They are attacked by Sylvia, who is now in adult form thanks to the ether she was given by her father. Sylvia is holding Ariane hostage and tries to kill Ryan and Kirin, but Ariane breaks free and saves them. She then transforms into a child since she has used up all her ether. They board the Heaven's Ring in order to stop it and hopefully bring Safkiel to his senses. The main purpose of Heaven's Ring, it turns out, is to drain the ether from other worlds. Inside, the kids get caught by Safkiel, who turns Ryan to stone. Ariane and Kirin then escape through the gateway at the center of Heaven's Ring. Throughout Chapter 1, the story and game felt vaguely familiar to me. I was surprised to find that I must have already played the early stages of this game, most likely way back in 2002. Well, I'm sure I can appreciate it a lot more now, having played through all the previous games. I'm going to finish it this time. But that's not going to be easy, since the gameplay of Farland 8 is cumbersome, to say the least. Instead of sticking with the tried and true system that had been gradually improved throughout the first seven games, 8 seems to be trying to reinvent the wheel. I guess just because it's on Windows now. You have to right click to select your characters, and if the cursor happens to be right over the menu that pops up, it will instantly select whatever option it lands on. The only reliable way I found to select what you want is to hold right click and then release it on your desired option. Even then, I found myself occasionally selecting things I didn't want and wasting turns. And after a particularly long day of playing the game, I woke up the next day with a weird tendon pain in my right hand. Holding right click while moving the mouse around is just not something my hand muscles are accustomed to doing. So anyway, you do move and attack similarly to the previous games. The scaling effect when entering battle looks very late 90s to me. Unfortunately though, we're back again to having to select move from the menu, and then manually select attack. I thought they already solved this way back in Farland 5. What a downgrade. Another huge loss is the fact that you can't see how much HP you or the enemies have left. In the PC-98 games, it was so easy. Why in the world couldn't they have done it the same on Windows? Here you have to right click on a unit and select status to see their HP or press F7 for a list of all units and their HP. Only if you play the game for yourself can you possibly understand how god-awful this is. In a strategy game like this, you've got to be able to easily check how much HP each unit has left. In the options, we can select a faster walking speed, but my favorite option, fast battle animation, is gone, leaving only the option to turn it either off or on. So I did end up turning it off a lot in this one to speed things up, once I'd seen all the animations in a particular stage, which is really a shame because I love watching the animation, just not when it uses up so much of my time. The game is also much, much harder than any of the previous ones for two major reasons. The healing magic that you could use for free once every turn in the previous games has been majorly nerfed. Now healing is a special ability, which works like the character's special abilities in the previous games. It uses up an entire turn, so you can't even move before you heal. Healing can also only be used once every few turns, since special abilities take time to recharge. On top of that, it doesn't even restore very much HP. So the secret to Farland 8 is just using tons of cheap healing items to keep your characters alive. There are no treasure chests to find in this one, but money and shops are back. And what's also back is alcohol. Farland 8 has vodka, which revives a character and restores some HP. The other thing that makes the game harder than the previous entries is the fact that you can only save at the beginning of each stage. Sure, the save feature is available at any time, but if you save in the middle of a stage and load, it will just take you back to the beginning of the stage. So if you get game over, you've got to replay the entire stage from the beginning. A huge change from the previous games, which had autosave, allowing you to start over from the beginning of your current turn at any time. And the difficulty is probably the reason why they added one new useful feature, a guard command. This allows the characters to take much less damage when attacked. The compromise though is that they can't counterattack while guarding, 
so you're not always necessarily going to want to use this. So moving on, when we complete chapter 1, we get to choose which of the next two chapters we want to do next. If you played the previous two games, it's pretty obvious from the chapter titles that chapter 2 relates to Farland 6, and chapter 3, Farland 7. We'll do chapter 2 first. Ariane, still in child form, is transported to the world of Farland 6. There we take control of Zero, Maisha, Crook the Squirrel, and Lady the Goddess. The main protagonists from both Farland 6 and 7 seem to have been deliberately omitted from the game, though they do get name dropped quite a few times. You also may remember that Farland 6 had two different endings, depending on which of the two sisters you had the protagonist choose, and Farland 8 confirms that the Alicia ending is canon, because in this one, Zero is married to Alicia's sister, Maisha. I now wish I had mentioned in my Farland 6 video that the two of them get married in that ending. In this chapter, the characters have to protect Ariane from her father, and they eventually end up traveling through a portal taking them all to Farland 8 world. In chapter 3, Kirin is transported to Farland 7 world, and Sylvia is also there to steal the world's ether. To protect Kirin, we take control of Kale the falcon, Naju the wolf, and Muilana, who was a character who never joined the party in 7. She's queen of the cat people, and basically Naju's pushy girlfriend. There are some pretty major spoilers in chapter 3, so I'll put a warning here for those who are concerned. It came to light partway through Farland 7 that Naju is a beast god who has been reborn, similar to how Van was a lion god. Mui Lana is anxious for Naju to remember how they were totally a couple in Naju's previous life, and they learn of a spring hidden underneath Kale's village that restores memories. Mui Lana drags the reluctant Naju there. It might seem weirdly cruel to force someone to regain their memories from a previous life, so I should probably make clear that Naju does eventually decide to drink from the spring himself. When he does, we're shown a flashback of him, Muilana, and the falcon god Phoenix, confronting the same angel who Safkiel met earlier in the game. We learn that these three are the ones who drove the human gods from their world, and back to Farland where they came from, then closing the gates between their worlds. The angel clarifies that those human gods are all actually only servants of their one true god, and says that their intention was only to help this world and guide them on the one true path. Before the flashback abruptly ends, Phoenix says, could it be that these angels actually come from a different far land? And different far land is written in yellow text to show that it's important. It would be great to learn more about the lore of the far land universe and how these games all tie together, but unfortunately this is all we're going to get here in this game. When we get back to our characters, Muilana is excited that Naju has his memories back, and indeed I guess now he is a little bit less annoyed by Muilana's advances than he was before. Naju also casually says to Kale, Phoenix, we're going to need your power too. Kale is like, what, I'm not Phoenix. Just drink the water, Kale. Lisa, drink the water! And then Kale's class is changed to Phoenix. So of course the Farland 7 characters also end up going through a portal for the fourth and final chapter where all the characters team up to stop Saf Kiel. Ryan is no longer turned to stone, Ariane becomes a teenager again, and the two of them are eventually class changed to super versions of themselves who can fly. Kirin is also given a powered up adult form. Like in previous games though, when characters class change, they lose all their experience and start from scratch at a predetermined level. On top of that, this one also has accessories the characters can equip, and when they class change, their equipped accessories simply disappear. Why you gotta do this to me, Farland Story? While I had found myself really excited and involved in the story in chapters 2 and 3, 4 feels a bit like things are winding down as we edge ever closer to the inevitable climax. It's a familiar feeling from the previous games. There is one gotcha twist where the former prince, now king, uses the party to get close to Safkiel and attempt to kill him, but it leads to just one stage where we have to take him out before the rather predictable final battle with Safkiel, where of course he is transformed to a large demonic end boss. After he is defeated, he actually sacrifices himself to save the world using Heaven's Ring, destroying it in the process. Sylvia also stays behind to help. 
She was evil through most of the game, so of course they decided to kill her off too. The final scene has no surprises, as the characters all return to their own worlds. You guys can save your world, you just have to stop using ether to power your technology. So no more floating cities or giant rings in the sky, kay? Yeah, and definitely don't go opening any more gates to other worlds. Now excuse us while we pass through this gate back to our own respective worlds. There's a credit sequence with some illustrations. The character design was again done by Takeshi Kusaka, though of course the Farland 6 characters were originally designed by Kazue Yamamoto. For music, we now change over to Kenji Ichio, who became the main composer for all the remaining Farland games. Takahiro Kaku, who joined in Farland 6, is credited probably for the arrangements. The only option for music in this one, by the way, is Redbook CD audio. There's no MIDI, but the music overall is fine and probably actually one of the more competently done aspects of the game. Finally, Atsuyoshi Isemura is probably credited just because of the one reused tune from Far Land 6. It's unusual for the series to reuse melodies from previous games, by the way, but here you go. Throughout most of Chapter 1, I really hated this game. It's awkward to play, and on top of that, the difficulty felt unreasonable. I was struggling to stay alive, let alone gain experience so that my characters stood a chance of getting better. But once I got the hang of it, Farland 8 made me feel a strange sensation that I hadn't felt in a Farland game before. What's this? Challenge. Real, actual, fun challenge? Not sure why they suddenly decided to make the game challenging at this late stage in the series. But this game served to remind me why games need challenge in the first place. I found myself excited to retry the stages, feeling that this time I can do better. And finishing them often gave me a real sense of accomplishment. Unfortunately, in the final stages, the game eventually becomes pretty easy, just like all the other Farland Story games. This one has only 30 stages instead of the standard 40, but still feels just as long or longer due to the time-consuming drawn-out nature of the stages. Long stages were one of my pet peeves in the previous games, and yeah, it really isn't a great aspect of this one either. But definitely the best part of Farland 8 is the story. I may have ragged on it toward the end for being a bit predictable, but nonetheless, if you've played Farland 6 and 7, then 8 is a real treat. Even knowing the previous characters were going to make an appearance, I wasn't expecting the plot to be so interesting, tying the characters and worlds of the games together. It's even worth suffering through the game's terrible interface to see what happens. And like the previous game, there are no ports of Farland 8, it's only for Windows. So this is the last mainline Farland Story game, but there is actually one Farland Story I didn't cover. Farland Story 2 for Super Famicom isn't considered part of the mainline games, and is a completely original game that never appeared on PC-98 or Windows. It was only ported to the Sega Saturn as Farland Story Habo no Mai. I should really play through it someday. Apparently Ark from Farland 1 through 3 even makes an appearance, but I'm not going to make a video about this one. There are also, of course, five mainline Farland games that come after Farland Story 8, all of which have considerably different gameplay from the Farland Story games. Of these, I've only played all the way through the final one, Farland Symphony, way back when it was brand new. As much as I'd love to make videos about each of these, I think I'm going to stop here for now. Look, these Farland videos just don't tend to get as many views as some of my other ones, which is understandable. I don't expect everyone to want to watch 8 videos about a series they've never heard of and are probably never going to play. Which is why I want to give a special thanks again to those of you who stuck around and kept watching all of these, and an extra special thanks as usual to patrons and YouTube members. All of you are what keep the channel going. This has been Mr. Jakes from Basement Brothers. Thanks for watching.